Hi, good evening. Um, as you guys know, my name is Jennifer Lee. Uh, today I'll be giving a grand round on to dilate or not, differential diagnosis of ear fullness and when to uh, when I think that people should be dilated or not. It's a common question that we all struggle with in terms of when to operate and when not to operate. Um, I have no official financial disclosures. I have uh, given some, or had some discussions with the Clarent or Intellis or Propel, but I haven't had any financial uh, associations. So we have a pretty full agenda. We're going to talk about a lot of things today. We're going to go over some basic anatomy, all the things that people can ha have that lead to ear fullness, but isn't actually dilatory dysfunction of the station tube. And then we'll actually go into dysfunctions of the station tube, which is really broken into three different areas. Uh, and then we'll talk about management of uh, dilatory dysfunction okay. of the station tube. So, especially uh, here, I can't uh, talk about the station tube without at least giving a nod to history. And uh, Ujiri had uh, published about uh, Aristotle as well as Eustatius. And Aristotle described this tube like structure that connected the ear to the nose. Uh, but the actual anatomy of the eustachian tube, in terms of being composed of bone and cartilage, was actually described by Eustachius in 1562. There are many other uh, leaders in the field that have come since then, but we that would be a grand house in and of itself. So we'll proceed with the anatomy. So uh, commonly, the eustachian tube is about 31 to 41 millimeters in length. In men, it tends to be closer to the 39 to 41, and in females, so it's closer to the lower range. I can see and in children, it, we tend to think it's about roughly half the size of adults. Uh, we talk about the angle, uh, but I think what's important to know is that it's actually an S-shaped curve-like structure that not only is angled uh, from the horizontal, it's also angled laterally. So you want to remember that as it's coming towards you. There are two main muscles that we think about when we talk about the station tube, for me. It's the liber vela palatini and the tensor vela palatini. And the tensor vela palatini is really the main muscle responsible for opening of the station tube because the resting state of the station tube is to close. And this is really important when we talk about the differential of your fullness. So there's been several anatomical uh, literature out there uh, about the station tube. There's a couple that really look at uh, temporal bones and CTs. And these are some of the things that I thought were interesting because uh, you think about children, uh, eustachian tubes to be smaller, but really it's actually the same, about the same width in the lumen throughout the length of the children's eustachian tube, whereas in the child, in the adult, it actually is large at the pharyngeal opening and then narrows as it curves. And a lot of the growth is actually more in the cartilaginous portion, although there is some growth in the bony portion as well, the major portion is in the cartilaginous portion. The other spectrum, when we look at, there's more and more literature about what happens with changes in aging. And uh, there is some literature in, in the Japanese literature about tensor vela palatini as atrophy as we age, especially as we get towards about 70 to 80. And that's where some of the temporal bone dissections were done. And it shows both that the tensor vela palatini atrophies, as well as it decreases in length, and may have some difficulty opening or contraction. Uh, these are some interesting measures that I wanted to share with you about basically when we're thinking about if we're going to cannulate the eustachian tube in some manner, we want to know what kind of range we're looking at in terms of the anatomy. And adults, uh, as you say, that see down here, it really shows that it's in the roughly in the range of uh, the range that I talked about earlier, the 31 to 41. And in this particular study, it was in the 37 uh, range. And you can see how it grows uh, at, from a three-month-old up to the 17-month-old. And what I wanted to bring out is the narrowest portion of the station tube, we actually know, prefer not to call it the isthmus, we like to call it the junctional area, uh, because the junctional area is where there's actually what we think to be a valve that can control the opening and closing uh, of the station tube, and it's actually uh, more medial to the narrowest portion or the bony uh, area of the eustachian tube. And so in theory, it is possible by cannulating the cartilaginous soft tissue portion that you could have some effect to the valve. 
So this is basically my grand rounds in a nutshell, or at least the first half of it. And so whenever I have a patient come to me for an ear fullness referral, this is the flow chart that I'm working through in my head that hopefully it will be helpful to you guys. Uh, the reason why I personally like you station tube dysfunctions is it's actually the crossroads of a lot of different subspecialties within our field. And hopefully I'll be able to highlight some of those uh, areas as we move along. So when people come to me and they say my ear is full or clogged or they have pressure or they feel like they have muffled hearing, uh, they're really telling me that they have an innervation or a simulation of a nerve. And so what I go over commonly is the six different nerves that can, can give you the sensation or the feeling of ear fullness. And it's remarkable how complex the sensory organ or sensory innervation of the ear and ear canal is. And how this may have nothing to necessarily do with the eustachian tube, but patients may in fact feel the same type of ear fullness. So one of the most common things I get is actually migraines. Uh, a lot of people come in with unilateral ear fullness and upon diving into their history, this is one of the first things I try to rule out as a potential uh, cause of eustachian, of ear fullness. And it's surprising how many people will talk about this, but more importantly, whenever I have patients come in and they say their ears are full and they're having vertigo, I steer pretty clear away from dilatory dysfunction because uh, that's extremely rare for that to happen. So the other thing I look at is uh, the fifth nerve that gets uh, stimulated in the sensation of ear fullness, and that's temporal mandibular dysfunction. And so this is probably one of the, uh, I like, I personally like this algorithm. It comes from uh, Canada, actually, and it's pretty straightforward. And it helps to differentiate. A lot of people like to think, okay, if you have ear fullness and your ears are fine, then you must have something wrong with your temporal mandibular joint. But in most of the cases, that's not true. It's not that there's something wrong with the joint, per mm -hmm. se. It's more mm -hmm. along the muscles that uh, are near that joint. Mm -hmm. And as I uh, showed you before, the tensor villi palatini and the liber, levator villi palatini do attach to the medial aspects of the eustachian tube. And for that reason, if you have temporal mandibular dysfunction or masticatory myalgia, or some level of pain issue with the muscles around there, you're going to get a cessation of ear fullness. And you may even have uh, ear fullness that's very similar to somebody who has a station tube dilatory dysfunction. So this is what I commonly use. And usually people who have temporal mandibular dysfunction or masticatory myalgia, their primary symptom that they present with is pain, pain with fullness. And if I ask them more, it's usually associated, they'll, what, the other thing I commonly ask when they tell, ask, say that they have pain is I ask them to point to the source of the pain. And they will you mostly point here or here, or they do one of these things. And so that is, to, in, my, uh, in my opinion, also a helpful hint that is unlikely to be a dilatory dysfunction of the eustachian tube. Finally, there's, um, or there's other things I also look at to go into more of the rhinology literature. Uh, so, a lot of times people say, okay, if my nose is really obstructed on one side, that has nothing to do with your station tube, right? Well, it turns out there's actually literature that states the contrary. So if you have a very deviated septum, and we've actually looked at people who have uh, their ear pressure through tympanometries before and after a septoplasty only. So nothing was done to the eustachian tube. And these are people don't, that don't prior, that did not have any prior middle ear disease. But when you look at that, the side of the obstruction, their uh, middle ear pressure actually goes from severely negative to less negative. So negative ear pressure, middle ear pressure is considered one objective uh, measure of dilatory dysfunction of the eustachian tube. And in fact, if you have a severe nasal septal deviation and you correct that, you can actually correct some level of that negative pressure. And so what's interesting in this study is that uh, they had an end negative pressure after surgery in the range of minus 12, and that's actually uh, the people in the 1950s, there are a lot of studies that were done. If you have a slightly negative middle ear pressure, people actually perceive a more clear hearing than if it was completely zero. Uh, so 
it's usually the threshold is about 20 to 25. And if it goes more negative than that, people feel the sensation of fullness and pressure. But if you're in the range of zero to even negative 20, people so right actually now, perceive a room, more clear like hearing. So yeah. for these people, these are people that didn't have eustachian tube problems, that didn't complain about eustachian tube problems, but in fact, you see an improvement in their middle of the function by subcapacity alone. We can turn it that off. And so what about chronic sinusitis? Is this affected? So we know that the mucosa that lines the nasal cavity and the sinuses also extend partially into the opening of the station tube, and some portions about the medial third of the or you know, the medial third of the station tube. And a lot of studies look at ETDQ as one of the prompts or patient-reported outcome measures to look at uh, improvement of station tube function before and after intervention. I well, hope, hope so SNOT and ETDQ actually correlate very closely, and SNOT 22 has been a well-validated uh, patient-reported outcome measure. And if you if you look at this particular study uh, done by Patol, what you can see is that a lot of these people did not have, these are people from the otology group, so these are not people who had sinusitis, but their pre-surgery SNOT scores are significant. They have a mean score of 51. So you're starting out with significantly high SNOT scores. So we don't know why. I mean, there is a certain, there, part of the SNOT 22 does have an ear component to it. But it, this isn't the only literature that shows, but there are other literature that shows that a correlation, uh, a correlation between chronic sinusitis or severity of sinusitis or a patient reported outcome of sinusitis and uh, the severity of eustachian tube dilatory dysfunction. So, Sometimes this is true, but sometimes also people can have no eustachian tube dilatory dysfunction and still have very high ETDQs and high SNOP and actually have chronic rhinosinus sinusitis. So you can have either or, and that's I think important to note um, in your workup that you want to make sure that, at least for me, that's part of my history taking is to identify their history for chronic sinusitis. So now we're going to talk about eustachian tube uh, dysfunction. So eustachian tube dysfunction in, uh, in a consensus statement by the AO really dis, uh, divides eustachian tube dysfunction into three broad categories. And that's patchless, where the eustachian tube is excessively large, barometrically challenged, and those are patients that at sea level, uh, their audiogram or their tube manometry is essentially normal. And the third level, which is uh, dilatory dysfunction. And so dilatory dysfunction is further divided into several categories. So we're going to go over patchless eustachian tube first. So this is when we talk about, so this is a very common uh, misdiagnosis that I find in my referral base. So I have a lot of patients who come to me for a second opinion for a balloon dilation. And uh, upon investigation of their history, they'll tell me usually a common thing they tell me is that sound is very loud, everybody seems to be screaming at me. Or when I ask about tinnitus, because that's a common, I ask five questions I always ask to every ear problem, ear patient is tinnitus, vertigo, hearing loss, ear pain, and ear drainage. So that's part of my screening questions. And so when I go to tinnitus, they inevitably say that they either hear a pulsatile heartbeat in their ear, or sometimes they'll say they hear themselves talking in their ear. And those are good, um, hopefully it'll work. Uh, so we look at, so this is, was a video of the eardrum moving with every breath. Uh, but that is one of the things that I do. I put a 30 degree, I, for all of my eustachian tube patients, I do a, a 30 degree endoscope both in the ear as well as in the nose. And I can see the eardrum move with every breath. And that is uh, one of the primary symptoms or signs that I look for when I see patients with a patchless eustachian tube. The other thing I do in my practice is that uh, every person that comes to me also gets a patchless testing. And so uh, what, what you can see on the left here is that with what we do is uh, you have it at baseline, then you have uh, contralateral breathing through the nose. So if the person's symptomatic on the right, then you have them breathe only through their left nose. 
and that should lead to no change in the right side, but uh, you'll see you'll look for changes on the left side. And then you look for ipsilateral breathing, and if they have a patch of the sensation too, you can actually see uh, changes in the pressure uh, meter as they breathe that correlates with each breath. This is also helpful to me because uh, we look at their baseline tympanometry, and patients who have superior canal dehiscence or we have vascular malformations, you can also see it there, there's a baseline change that, that correlates with their breathing, or sorry, with their heartbeat, for instance, or just a very uh, uneven or seesaw-shaped baseline, and that's another indication to me that there's something more going on here than just an ear fullness or eustachian tube dysfunction. So dilatory dysfunction of the eustachian tube uh, really breaks down three potential causes for why you can have it. But we'll talk about what kind of uh, burden this has. Unfortunately, some people say there's 1% of the population, but that's basically information that extends from uh, pediatric studies that was done by Bluestone going into the adult uh, population. The study that we have investigating specifically adults is from po uh, Shin and Poe's group. Basically, it looks that states that about two million visits per year uh, is the burden of these particular kinds of problems like eustachian tube dysfunction, otitis, nevus diffusion, and retraction. And so, I think this is very this is interesting, but requires a lot more studying, in my opinion, because uh, it's two million visits. But what's the cost per visit, for instance, or is it the same people coming in? We just don't know. So the function of the eustachian tube that we think is uh, adversely affected in dilatory dysfunction, these are the three normal functions, ventilation, protection of the middle ear, and clearance of the middle ear. And we think it's a combination of all three, ventilation meaning that the pressure is not able to equalize with changes in elevation, uh, protection and clearance, so there's something with the mucosa that is inflamed so it doesn't, it's not able to properly protect the middle ear from the uh, pathologies or occurrences in the nasal cavity. Or clearance, so there's something going on with the muscles that prevent it from uh, contracting that allow opening up the So I talked about the three different types of dilatory dysfunctions of the station tube, and they break down into anatomical problems, primary muscle problems, and primary mucosal problems. And this is interesting, especially as I talked about before, when we're looking at the extension of uh, chronic sinus problems, especially chronic sinus problems with polyps or, uh, or eosinophilic uh, sinusitis that then extends into the middle ear. So when we think about anatomic obstruction, we uh, people actually, it's not commonly known that if your adenoids were excessively large, or some people would call that Gerlach tonsils if you have adenoids that grow into the opening of the station tube, can actually physically obstruct the station tube opening. And we've had patients that have had these issues and that will come in with effusions, and when you clear the adenoids, the effusion disappears. And uh, this is you know, not too big of an extent of logic because if we think about nasopharyngeal cancer patients, they basically have anatomic obstruction. And that's what leads to them having effusions and um, potentially advanced disease. So once I've uh, figured out a history, then I look into, uh, I have a qualified measure and I use patient surveys. But the one that I particularly like is called the Station 2 Dysfunction Questionnaire or the ETDQ. This is a validated study. The other one that was described is from Germany, it's called the ETS uh, by Sudoff. Uh, the reason why I think that one hasn't become as popular here is, is a, it's a two-part. The ETS requires both the patient's uh, reported outcomes but also has a component that involves a tympanogram. Whereas the ETDQ is purely a patient measure. It's seven questions. It's very easy to do. It's difficult to argue against the simplicity of it. So because I think that's why it was very widely adopted. But also it is a pretty good uh, validated study. It has been validated in other countries as well, including the Netherlands and Brazil um, and Germany. And it basically looks at these seven symptom scores. And if you have a combined score that is 14.5 or greater, 
then supposedly it had a very good sensitivity and specificity. But that was in, in compared to control, and that was basically measured up against the SNOP 22, which I think are some of the issues. Uh, because you, we know that there's a close association of the two, so if one's going to be higher, the other's going to be never really higher, whether they're related to each other or not necessarily. Um, the other thing I think that makes the ETDQ a little bit difficult is that you can be scoring twos in everything, and if you did, you'd be 14, right? So. If you felt that only one item was a moderate problem, you would automatically flip to the 14 point five. So it's pretty, it's not too hard, I think, to have a, a positive ETGQ. The way I use this is that you use it more as a trending factor. What if people started high and they changed over time with treatment? So wait. Yes. You're saying that, what's the total score? It's seven times 49? Yes. And all it takes is a 14.5 to have 100% sensitivity for, I mean, it's, it's a really low score, isn't it? Correct. I agree. So it, I just wonder about the psychometric evaluation of this problem. You know, you, having done a couple of problems over the years, one that was reviewed as being very poorly done of mine, and one that was <laughs> reviewed very, I, I understand a little bit more about not all problems were created equal. Yes. Psychometrically. So I wonder, I mean, I, I'm just saying, if that number just strikes me as so low. I, I'm so interested to see what the, when they did the evaluation of this, and how many patients they tested it in and, and what kind of numbers and who was the psychometrician who looked at it, because it does seem like just a, yeah, a great that, distribution. Yeah, that's why I put the, they took 50 patients and they took 25 without um, disease. That was their control. But this, this is what they published or they stated in their initial publication and that has changed. So thank you, Sam, for prompting for our next. Uh, <laughs> now, there are other things like minimally clinically important difference, MCID calculations and things like that that are done. Correct. So, so yeah. they did do an MCDI score, and they also did a score on, or a curve under uh, the area under the curve score as well uh, to look at. And then they did an alpha coefficient to see uh, reproducibility if they were if they had. Uh, reproducibility, but it was done within four weeks. And if you look at the, I'll show you guys later, but a lot of the dilatory dysfunction uh, literature is more that you get better response even a year after. So who knows at four weeks what kind of difference you're really getting. But some of the limitations of the ETDQ. So I have concerns or reservations about the ETDQ, as I already stated. Uh, one of the things that, uh, and this is a published issue, is that it's completely unable to discriminate between patchless or dilatory dysfunction. So you get equally high scores, whether you have excessively large eustachian tubes or excessively dysfunctional eustachian tubes that can't open <coughs> properly for whatever reason or are narrow. So basically, you sh I view this as a very cautionary type of patient report outcome measure. This isn't a diagnostic tool. This, I believe, is a survey, it is a patient reported outcome that helps you measure a change from that person's perspective or no change with time and with interventions. That is, I think, the, that is pretty much the only way I use it now. I use it very, I, that's why I find it helpful, but I don't use it as my main diagnostic tool to diagnose the station to filter and dysfunction. But, the reason why I bring this up is because most of literature does use this as a outcome measure for East Asian to dilatory dysfunction and its treatment. So we'll go over that as well. So in terms of uh, once I get that kind of history, then we go over uh, the physical exam. And in the exam, I really uh, do a modified uh, toy beads as well as a valsalva. So in the ear, I have really actually have them a pinch your nose, close your mouth and blow and see if there's a movement in the ear drum. And in the initial studies, uh, Valsalva tests isn't as accurate for di dis diagnosis of eustachian tube dysfunction. It's more usually in the range of 60 to 70 percent. The toin is actually much more accurate. Uh, the toin is in the range of 80 to 90 percent accuracy for dilatory dysfunction. And the way it's supposed to be done is you measure the changes in pressure in the nasopharyngeal area with the nose closed and when the patient swallows. 
the way I use it is I actually <coughs> use my endoscope to have the patient swallow and see whether the eustachian tube is moving. And that's why I find the endoscope to be useful because the eustachian tube really is a dynamic structure. Its resting state is to be closed, so you don't know if it's going to open or not if the patient is uh, paralyzed on the anesthesia table, for instance. So the decision I make is when they're awake, and if I can't endoscope them, then I usually don't do the surgery because I don't know if they actually have a movement disorder of the eustachian tube. So another common question I get is about imaging. Do you need imaging for the eustachian tube? Uh, and the answer, if you're going to do a dilation, the answer is no. Um, in terms of is there diagnostic measures that help us figure out whether somebody has eustachian tube dysfunction using imaging, uh, the answer is uh, uh, Historically, fluoroscopy has been done where you can insufflate the eustachian tube through the middle ear, uh, the remeringotomy. Um, or the, in uh, Europe, especially in Germany, there's a tubometer where you can, with the cannulation uh, apparatus, where you can actually do fluoroscopy that way as well. So that is a theoretical way to diagnose eustachian tube dilatory dysfunction uh, using fluoroscopy. In a daily practice, it's not really a doable or practical kind of diagnostic measure. Uh, but one of the reason why I bring this, uh, this particular slide up is because common questions I get is, why would you want to do something to a person if you don't know if their carotid is dehist or not? And the question is, is that necessary to know? <coughs> so uh, this is probably one of the largest retrospective studies uh, of complications or problems with the uh, eustachian tube dilation, for instance. And it's 569 patients, and uh, 284 of them got a CT. And uh, the thing I find interesting with this is uh, the average rate that you would have a carotid dehiscence is about 6% of the population would have. Uh, a carotid dehiscence. And if you have a dehiscence, how close are you? And you're basically zero. You're like next to each other. And if you don't, what is the average distance between the carotid and the narrowest portion or the bony portion of the eustachian tube? It's roughly in the range of one to two millimeters. So even when it's not dehisced, or one to three, sorry, one to three millimeters. So it's even when it's not dehisced, you're very close to uh, the carotid. Uh, but the important thing is, regardless of whether it's dehisced or not, uh, you the imaging and you know that with or without imaging it doesn't change actually your management if you were to choose to do balloon dilutions. The complications that were reported in this uh, paper of the patients with emphysema and hypoglossal paresis, I have no idea about how the path is on that one. Uh, but the emphysema is very common. It's actually I've heard about it in several other locations. Uh, and uh, those, those people all had an intact carotid, so all of these complications turned out to happen in people who had an intact carotid. And the, this was done with a different kind, uh, a balloon that had, uh, it has a tapered end that can actually insert into the middle ear if you chose to do so. So I'm going to go, I'm going to talk about surgical therapy, but I'm going to take a brief moment to talk about medical therapy, and there's a reason why there's no real good slide, because there is no good medical therapy for you know, dilatory dysfunction of the eustachian too. Uh, so a lot of things that I talk about that I'll go over here is what people commonly do is oral steroids, topical steroids, decongestants like Afrid, uh, Otovent, airplanes. Uh, so these are things that I've looked into. There is some cohort studies for airplanes, for instance, or steroids, but uh, oral steroids that has no, uh, at least no measurable effect, unfortunately, to the station two uh, dilatory dysfunctions. Uh, there, ha there was some study initially, back when uh, people were trying to cannulate the station two. Uh, there were measures of injecting steroids or into the eustachian tube, and that had some limited uh, benefit, but that was in about you know, five patients, so mm -hmm. unsure what kind of effect that has. Decongestants didn't, hasn't shown anything. So in terms of surgical therapy, I put this up also for, yes? Have there been any studies about the otovent? How effective is yeah, it? Yeah, good question, sorry. Um, not in pediatrics. There, are, there was a cohort study or like case control of like three, 
Um, they didn't specifically mention it to be the auto vent. They described it as a tubometer that allowed air to pass to allow uh, basically pressure or equalization of the eardrum, which is essentially kind of what the auto vent does to some degree. Uh, and they showed improvement in this patient's report symptoms, but no necessary improvement in the two pattern rounds. And I think that's another, we'll go into that in a bit as well. But uh, the reason why I put this slide up is I find it very interesting. So the surgical treatment of these station two goes is everywhere, all over the place. Pretty much if you can stick it into something, we've tried it these station two. <laughs> Um, the one that wasn't on this table that I wanted to bring up that was very interesting is House reported uh, a case of five people that he actually did a middle fossa approach, lifted the temporal lobe to drill the eustachian tube, to stick silastic sheet in it to, in hopes that it would reconstitute the mucosa of the eustachian tube to allow repeat function. And I think what this says in my mind is the extent that patients will go to, to get to help relieve that symptom of ear fullness. People are willing to do everything from getting brain surgery to having a laser attached to their eustachian tube in their nose while they're awake in the clinic if they can get rid of the ear fullness. It can really drive people crazy. So that's why I bring this up, and I find, personally, I find it very interesting uh, history, historically. Has there ever been any attempts at bone tox injection, since you're using LSD? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So sometimes people come in with a clicking sound that's actually audible to you. It's an objective clicking sound. And you can see when they're swallowing or uh, when they're talking, you'll see the, tense, the palate elevate. You'll see the, uh, when you look in the nose, you'll see the station to open, close, open, close as the tensor villa is uh, contracting. And I have not found a literature about <coughs> Botox injection specifically to that area, but there was a guy in neurology here that was doing Botox to the areas around that that, as, as, at least reportedly, according to him, improved the clicking sound. Yeah, I had a patient with uh, palate of myoclonus that I injected the palate, and, yeah. and it helped with the clicking. Yeah. yeah. And so that's, uh, just to follow up with that, so the extension of that is patients who have cleft palate or who have had palate cancer or, or a palate surgery that affect the uh, tensor villi or libid or uh, villi palatini, they're going to get ear fullness and they may have some symptoms that are intermittent related to ear, ear eustachian tube dilatory dysfunction by an extension of that problem. So let's talk about the uh, my preferred method of managing the station tube problem, dilatory dysfunction of the station tube, and that's a balloon dilation of the station tube. And one of the common things I hear about is, well, it's like an angioplasty. So you're going to go in there and you're going to rotor rooter it out, or you're going to stretch it out, and it's going to be, is, are you going to keep the balloon there? These are questions I commonly get. So I want to show you the way it works. And so basically, the way the balloon works is you tunnel it through the eustachian tube, and you leave it there. Uh, the FDA approval is for two minutes. Uh, the literature is everywhere when you go into published literature both in this country and around the world. People have done three minutes, four minutes, six minutes, one minute, it's everywhere. Uh, but the FDA approval is for two minutes and that's, we'll go over the uh, randomized controlled trials. Uh, they, they are for two minutes. And so we know, and we know this, and I'll show you <coughs> the next slide how that works. So we know this because there were uh, pathology, there were biopsies done in the opening of the uh, the mucosa <laughs> station before and after dilation, and this was done by Dr. Poe in 2015. And so what it shows is that when you do the biopsies, what happens is that there is some uh, injury to the uh, surface mucosal cells, uh, but more importantly, what changes is the lamina propria changes a bit, and the level of inflammation dies down and you have lymphocytes that go away from the uh, undersurface and then it allows rejuvenation of the mucosa. So that is more consistent with what we see at least anecdotally and in um, the RCTs that we look at or the prospective studies we look at, where unlike most surgical, sur uh, surgical procedures we do, where 
maybe not for all of you guys, uh, but for some people, usually the highest benefit of your surgery is up front, and then as time goes by, things kind of droop, things can grow back, things like that can happen. But in East Asian to dysfunction with the balloon dilation, a lot of literature and personal experience as well shows that the longer you wait, the more effectiveness you get. And so that kind of a test is, is, is in line with this uh, histopathology uh, report where you're looking at to reconstruction or rejuvenation of the surface mucosa. So the other thing that I find interesting is what actually happens to the middle ear when you stick a balloon in the nasopharynx and you dilate it. And this is where I found it very interesting is why, because uh, in the beginning and sometimes even now, I'll have patients where I'll do a dilation in the office and they'll say, Dr. Lee, I feel great already. I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, okay. Um, and, you know, I attribute it to a uh, uh, fact, but what I wonder, what I was wondering about, well, is there something to that? Is there something going on that in the middle ear? And so there is actually literature that looked at 25 uh, procedures in uh, cadav- cadaveric heads. And it turns out when you stick a balloon in there, um, the pressure in the, in the middle ear actually goes down after you remove it. And as I talked about, you can have uh, slightly negative ear pre- middle ear pressure actually leads to clearer hearing. But in this study, it was down to minus 42, which is that in a person that's alive should be symptomatic, meaning they should have started with earfulness and they should have ended with earfulness. Uh, they may have felt an improvement because they went from 99 positive pressure to negative pressure of 42, but uh, they should still have some fullness. So generally what I counsel my patients is you're going to feel full if you just do a dilation period. Um, if it works, then you'll see it usually in the range as early as four weeks, but the real range is more along the lines in my opinion of eight to 12 weeks. And then the literature that shows it's more in the range. The initial outcome is, uh, is in six weeks and you can get benefit up to 12 months after. Uh, I don't know how to make this work because I had a video up. This is what I need to do. That's wrong. That's wrong. Right. Nobody we dare. We do the videos later then. That way you guys aren't tortured. As it goes. Right. All you have to do is click that one and it will show me on the screen. Like, like this one here. It will show on the screen the whole thing. We'll move on. We'll move on. Uh, so this is an example that some of you guys have seen. So balloon uh, dilation before or after, and we uh, grade the d- level of dilation success uh, in three parts. So uh, minimal is basically looks about the same, maybe one millimeter difference between the way when it's touching each other, uh, the opening here. And you really want to look at the upper portion not the bottom portions, because the bottom, this is where your levator comes in, your tensor comes in. And so this is more of a function of muscle problems, less of a function of the uh, eustachian tube regulatory uh, problems. So I really look at the top portion. And so minimal or grade one is when there's really zero to one uh, millimeter of difference after dilation. And then grade two is when uh, you can have uh, about two to four. And then grade three is when you can actually see all the way up to uh, the uh, significant portion of the eight to 10 millimeters of into the uh, cartilaginous portion of the station two. So this would be considered down here to be a grade three level success. Is that view with a zero degree or an angle? No, so I use a 30, so uh, if I do it in the clinic, I use a 30 degree pediatric scope. And if I do it in the operating room, I use a 45 degree scope. Uh, I have done it with 0, 30, 45, 70, and a flex scope. That was very hard. Um, but I would say the 45 gives me the best view as well as just the technical issue of maneuvering a balloon and a endoscope in your hand together. Because the 70 gives me the, actually the best view, but it often hits the uh, guide or the balloon, whereas the 45 kind of gives me the balance between the two. But I, if you need to, you can do it with almost any scope. But in terms of photographic you know, documentation, I think you get a very good result with any angle scope. 
So now we're going to go over really uh, the randomized trials that are out. There are two trials that I want to go over uh, that I think are important to note. And then we'll talk about kind of what is new and what else is happening. Uh, so this was, there's two randomized trials. This was done by Meyer et al. And it was uh, done with 60 patients and it was partially funded by Intellis. Unfortunately, both randomized controlled trials have been partially funded by uh, a company, by a commercial company. And so their primary endpoint was at six weeks. And they looked at, as you can see here, they looked at tapanograms, they looked at Valsada maneuvers, and they also looked at ETDQ. And what's uh, interesting is that they noted a change uh, from baseline uh, about two. And I think the thing that I find most interesting is uh, the, uh, uh, I don't think of it, is, uh, the, yes, that the changes were sustained at 12 months. So that's, you have, you first noticed the change in six weeks, and the change was roughly about a 30 to 60 percent improvement. It was kind of a wide range compared to those that did not get a dilation. And that, but the important thing I, I would say that I thought interesting in this, in both studies actually, was that uh, the improvement was sustained at 12 months. So you had an initial improvement and it stayed the same. This is slightly different from the other randomized trial, which was uh, done by Poe et al. Both of these were uh, multi-center trials. And this was slightly bigger, it's 323 people um, across uh, multiple sections. And this was a different kind of balloon. It was funded by a client. And in this one, they showed, uh, they had a medical management group that was basically fluticasone that was sprayed two sprays in the affected side daily for six weeks uh, after. And uh, to qualify, you could have taken either prednisone or you could have taken fluticasone or you could have had a tube, but then you don't have a tube for the study. And this, they showed that compared to medical management, which is defined as fluticasone, once, uh, two sprays once a day, you had a uh, 50, I want to say, improvement compared to the control, which was uh, more like 13% uh, improvement. And what they looked at in terms of their measures were, once again, tympanograms, ETDQ, and uh, the, this is somewhat consistent with the other prospective studies. There are a lot of studies that were looking before this, case <coughs> controls or prospective studies that were smaller in size, to look at the benefit of the balloon dilation. And their end measures were tympanograms or ETBQs. Other people used functional measures, such as the Valsalva or Toynbee testing. Uh, but what I can tell you is that there, uh, what is interesting or frustrating, or it uh, depends on your perspective, is that the ETDQ may have significant improvements or significant change, not necessarily normalization, but significant change from the baseline. So they will go from 30 to 10, for instance, or 30 to 15, for instance. But the tympanogram may still be abnormal. So uh, they may go from a type B to a type C, but they won't necessarily normalize to a type A or they go from a type C uh, and uh, they go from very uh, having very negative pressure to having slightly less negative pressure. So I, I think that's interesting to note. And so this study is slightly different from the other in the sense that the improvement was not just steady, it was actually progressively increasing as time went by. But this one was aborted slightly early because the benefit was uh, shown to be significantly higher that uh, they wanted to offer the control group the option to balloon dilate. So it was aborted at 24 weeks. And, uh, so it's not as long of a study as the other one. So since then, uh, or since this, and this is literally out this year, so it's not very uh, long, uh, there are other studies that are coming out that are not randomized trials, but control trials, and that now we're starting to see control trials of things we really want to see, which is, does the balloon replace the tube? Is that really what's going, uh, is, does it do that? And there's a study in China that was done recently that came out a couple of months ago, 
uh, that really uh, looked at whether patients who had effusions and then they got balloon dilations and it was done for two minutes in the office, if that was enough to resolve their effusion. Um, they did tympanograms and ETD keys. And their tympanogram normalized from a type B to a type A, but it took one year. So the question is, if do we have, I think the interesting about, thing about that is maybe the balloon does work, or maybe it's just about passage of time, and that if you just waited, it would have worked anyway, like it would have gone away anyway, so does that really work? And secondly, even if it did work, I'm not sure I have a patient in any of my you know, population that would wait one year uh, without, without having an infusion go away, and they'd be okay with that. So. I find that to be interesting in my perspective, at least in my practice, when I looked at this, uh, my results compared to this, um, my uh, success rate is it's gotten lower as I, my patients have become more complicated, but it's in the range of 70%. When I look at, um, when I look at ETDQ, it's actually at the 85%, but when I look at tympanograms, it's more in the modest 60 66 to 70 percent. So it, it is consistent with the reported outcomes in terms of you may have a change in ETDQ but not a change in tympanograms. What I'm looking at with other people now, um, so there's several areas of interest that I'm looking at, but one, uh, one of them is the effects of radiation and balloon dilation or balloon dilation on radiated eustachian tubes. And um, when I look at that, I have a study, I have a cohort of of five patients that I've dilated for eustachian tube. Unfortunately, I've made one person patchless. Um, the other actually had all resolution of their middle ear effusion. And the good thing about this is what uh, one of my mentors taught me about if I was going to do eustachian tube balloon dilations, I better know how to fix patchless first. So the good thing is I did that. So I was able to fix that complication, but nonetheless, and it's not a complication I would like to have or wish upon any person. Uh, the second thing we look at are people who are diverse or hyperbaric therapy. The third we look at is I have patients that will like be pretty upset that their tympanograms uh, haven't normalized, and they insist that they hear better and they hear more clearly, but their audiogram doesn't necessarily reflect that. And so I'm working with Matt Fitzgerald and we're trying to see, is there an effect in the sound and noise, for instance, uh, when we do a dilation that you know, maybe we're not detecting and maybe tympanograms, or at least tone-based audiograms is not the correct measure to look at success or not, for instance. So these are my references that we're going to get to. I have a lot and there's even more. Uh, but Thank you very much for your time and your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And then hopefully we can get the a video load so people have something to look at while they ask questions. Hey Jennifer, thank you for an excellent talk. What is your preferred method for co correcting the patches? What should go Oh, through? yes. So, uh, it really depends on the extent of the patchless station too. So my preferred, uh, so I do an endoscopic exam and a symptom score exam. So if patients are not symptomatic all the time, I prefer medical therapy with hypertonic saline or patchelen, but a lot of my patients prefer hypertonic saline because A, it's cheap, B, they can titrate it uh, to their desire uh, compared to patchelen. If we're going to surgically do something, if they're very mild and it's more of like a grade one level opening where it's, uh, it's they have intermittent non-meeting and it's just about one millimeter to about two millimeter distance, then I'll radiate them or put a filler in them, uh, calcium hydroxyapatite uh, injection in there to fill it. Uh, and if they have a larger opening where it, it doesn't matter what maneuvers they do, they won't actually touch. Uh, the two tours don't touch, and the patient's symptomatic uh, constantly, so they're always having autophony. In those patients, I will do what I call is a stop replacement. And so this is an area that I've spoken with many companies in hopes to try to get something. But uh, what I use is an angiocath that has bone wax in it, which is 
has been published, is known to be used, is used in multiple areas, but technically it's, it's not it's not label use. Uh, and finally, for patients who fail the uh, who fail the stop replacement or if you like they want more, I'll suture it. So you get you can get a J suture and it's basically the same technique as laryngologist is used to suture it and tore it together. Jenny, I enjoyed that very, very much. At one point, it was thought that the eustachian tube dysfunction and chronic ear disease was due to constriction or pathology of the isthmus. Mm -hmm. Now, you're not getting anywhere near the isthmus when you're doing the dilatation, is that correct? Um, yes and no. Uh, we are getting quite near uh, because uh, the balloon that I particularly use is 16 millimeters by 6 millimeters uh, in width by length. So it does, uh, it, the tip, and has a leading tip of roughly about three to four millimeters. So that leading tip can hit the isthmus. Uh, but it's designed such that it's not supposed to go through the isthmus. It is known that it is possible, not in the newer iterations of some of the balloons, but in a lot of, if you have a tapered balloon, yeah, meaning it doesn't have a stopper or an enlargement or a dilated portion of the balloon, you can't enter the middle ear, and that has been done. Follow-up question, do you think we could get better successful revision tympanoplasties for chronic ear disease if they all have dilatations? Those are the patients that we would put tubes underneath the canal skin to see if we can get the, the uh, drum, but the, the failures usually are eustachian tube dysfunction failures. What do you think about that? I think that is a great study that I love to do. <laughs> uh, we have several patients who have gotten both. Uh, a dilation and a T plasty at the same time. And I can say in my N of four, <laughs> the rates are pretty good uh, in that they don't need a second T plasty. But the truth is that's not a very good study. <laughs> so I would like to have a control study. Hey, great talk. Thank you, uh, yeah. Jennifer. Um, a question I would have, you know, we're always trying to figure out tubes versus balloon yes. dilation. Do you think or have you seen that there are specific <coughs> symptoms that improve with a balloon dilation that wouldn't improve equally well with a tube? Oh, so I don't advertise this to patients because I don't want to dig the balloon for something that's not. But I will have patients who will state that their tinnitus has improved or their jaw pain has improved. And I think it's because of the way it works, the long detensor vela palatini, it has some effect there. So people can have less soreness if they had a lot of soreness in that area. Mm -hmm. That is what the tube does not do. But in terms of most, uh, if people want results now, right then and there, it's difficult to beat the tube. Because the tube, you get response immediately. And I also, if I have patients that I'm not clear on whether they actually have a dilatory dysfunction because their history is all over the place, or you station tube unfortunately actually looks closed, so I can't give them a clear yes or no, then I'll give them a trial of a marangotomy. Some of my colleagues I know do a trial of a tube, and if they respond, then I'll die with them because I know that they actually have it. By and large, though, I would say that a lot of this, actually, it's like a 50-50 thing, uh, half the time, though, but what's good about that, in my opinion, is that that allows me to convince them it's not the eustachian tube. Please see your neurologist for your migraines. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Jen, thank you for that talk. I noticed in the last randomized trial about half the patients um, had normal tympanograms. Yeah. And so when you have a patient with a normal tympanogram, what are your criteria for being candidates for dilation? Yes. Uh, so, if they, if we're talking about chronic dilatory dysfunction, I won't dilate them. But if I'm yeah. talking about, I won't dilate them if they have. If we're talking about chronic dilatory dysfunction, where patients are coming to me telling me they've had months or years of ear fullness, and their tints are totally normal, and I endoscope them, and their uh, eustachian tube looks normal, I won't dilate them. But if I see them, and they're uh, they give me a history of a barometrically challenged eustachian tube. That's one area I didn't completely cover today because it doesn't have a lot of literature right now, very much to none. And for those, I will dilate, but I'll modify my, my protocol. Because right now, um, and that's another thing I'm working to look at, is I would like to have a tympan 
tympanometry that I can do with people in the air, right? a portable tympanometry, because that would be ideal, especially for my divers or for my frequent flyers, because those people I have to rely on their history. And so for them, I rely on my history, and they give me a very convincing, barometrically challenged kind of history, and I'll give them a one-minute trial uh, after I observe them. So I'll actually kind of let them stew for a little bit, and I'll have them come back after a flight, for instance, and then I can see a retracted eardrum, or sometimes I can see a temporary effusion that I'll do the balloon dilation. And what were the outcomes in that RCT for the normal? Uh, oh, so for the uh, so for. You're talking about this, right? Where like yeah, uh, or the patient. next one, yeah. So then that well, is the next slide? Mm -hmm. So it looked like baseline. The top graph, half of them had normal tympanograms. Yeah, this is so that the tympanogram is this one. This one is just about uh, their uh, video uh, endoscope exam and to see oh. how. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. The other one, so the reason why the TIMP A's increase is because they convert. They go from a type B, type C to convert to a type A, so over time. Yeah, it's the other side. Yeah. It's okay. I was just wondering if you would do uh, dilations for chronic uh, atelier medium infusion. I know you mentioned some studies have looked at that. Yeah, so I do, uh, but I counsel them very differently. I usually do it with a tube, okay. and uh, what I will do with them is it's a question of history. Uh, so most of what I do kind of starts with the patient, essentially, as all of you guys do as well. Uh, so basically, if the patient tells me that this is their first episode, then I won't necessarily dilate them because I don't know what. I believe that the dilation, as, as according to the literature, it, it takes a while to work. Mm -hmm. And it's really designed, I think, to prevent the next one. So when I have people who have at least had two effusions, then I offer them a dilation and a discussion about, uh, you know, uh, if they have a dilation or uh, effusion at the time that I see them, then I'll offer them a tube and a dilation to prevent the need for another tube. Mm -hmm. Or if they have an effusion and they have a contraindication for a tube, so all of my radiating patients, um, then I'll do a dilation on them and they will resolve. On the barometric, I just want to make a comment. In my experience, there have been my, my best patients have been the ones that are barometrically challenged. The bar barotitis media. I've, I have maybe 50, 60 patients that we're trying to study now that they've just done beautifully with the dilation. So I think that's one. Of the, and the otitis media, I've been trying to study as well. So in the last two years, we've been doing a lot of dilations and uh, simultaneous with, with uh, chronic ear surgery. So hopefully, we'll get that study. What yeah, it's true. They're the ones that are most uh, enthusiastic about the procedure and they give the best ETDQ scores. The only issue I have is I'm not sure that that's necessarily our best outcome measure. Jennifer, thanks for the talk. Really informative and it comes up a lot in our, in our head and neck clinics. And um, could you talk, I know you're, gonna, you're studying this, but could you talk a little bit about what your algorithm is right now for managing a patient who's been radiated in nasal pharynx or is that a soft palate tumor and do you, are you dilating them? How does that work? Yeah, so in, so doing something to the eustachian tube for radiated patients is not new. Yeah. Um, it's been around their literature that I, I personally found that goes back to 1920s. Um, and it's like the Halstead paper from 1920s? <laughs> There's, um, and you can, yeah, actually. And you can see the effects of radiation on eustachian tube. Most of the time, the reality is that if you radiate eustachian tube, they end up patchless. Uh, it's actually, what we're treating is a temporary uh, you know, effusion, or the people who have chronic effusions. And so my protocol, the protocol we have for the, the or the paper that we have, yet yeah, we have to, we have written up but have not submitted yet, is, um, Patients who have had an effusion for uh, longer than a month and uh, who are disease-free, cancer-free for one, at least one year after the completion of the radiation therapy, who are symptomatic. And they get a one-minute dilation. And the one patient that got patchless, they, she got a two-minute dilation, at which point I learned, and everybody after that got a one-minute dilation.
And they will have resolution of their effusion as early as six weeks, and it'll stay uh, non-diffused. Uh, they won't recollect their effusion. And other than that first patient, everybody else uh, did not re, you know, turn back into becoming a patchless patient in the long run. And it's now been, uh, it's now been more than a year since the last one has uh, gotten dilated. So at least in long-term studies, and I think 12 months is a good time for us to now put this together, um, it doesn't mean they don't develop patchless tissue from the dilation. But it is important. Uh, the, the balloon eyes, I use, uh, which I found interesting after reviewing a lot of the literature, is actually the <coughs> widest in diameter available commercially. Uh, most of the balloons available in Europe and other places are two millimeter to three millimeter in diameter. We use a six millimeter diameter in this patient. Mm -hmm. And that is what was used in, uh, in uh, the RTT by Poe. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.